French haute couture is the apex of the fashion industry. A place among fashion's elite will depend on her latest collection. I just felt the train. I couldn't lift it off the floor. From award-winning New Zealand director Petra Bracelli. Yellow is forbidden. Tomorrow, 8.30 on Rialto Channel. I'm Francesca Rudkin. Welcome to a Rialto Channel podcast. Good to have you with us. My guest today is one of my favourite New Zealand filmmakers, Petra Brett Kelly. Petra never ceases to amaze me with the incredible stories she brings to the big screen with such grace and beauty and her constant drive as an independent filmmaker to do so. Her latest film, which debuted at the New Zealand International Film Festival last year, is called Yellow is Forbidden. It's a warm, captivating documentary that chronicles the life and work of a Chinese fashion designer and her quest to be recognised as an official haute couture designer. Petra, welcome. Thank you, and I'm so chuffed I'm one of your favourites. Thank you. <laughs> well, you never, you know what, I'm never surprised by what you tell me you're doing next because it's always something incredible that no one else has sort of seems to have heard of or thought of, and I don't know how you do it, but you find these stories. Oh, well, I think I just sort of am a reactive person. You know, I have an idea and I just go for it. Whereas maybe others kind of go, oh, that sounds like a good idea. In fact, actually, I'm often at my Q&As of my films and people come up to me and say, you know, I was thinking about making a film about X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, oh, oh too late. But, um, yeah, and I suppose because I, you know, I do have the luxury of being able to get up and move and go. You know, I have three passports. I don't have major commitments here and I can react and so yeah I just sort of follow my curiosity really. And that's pretty much much what happened with this film about Guao Pei who is the designer that you follow and of course we know her as um, the Chinese designer that dressed Rihanna in that large canary yellow dress it was also known as the omelette dress uh, in yeah. 2015 when she went to the Met Gala um, but yeah. you stumbled across her before then, was that right? Yeah, I sort of had this idea folder on my laptop and I had just completed my previous film, A Flickering Truth, and was going through my, my ideas folder and saw that I'd written myself something about this woman. I must have gone down the rabbit hole of the internet. And um, she used to make these shoes where a whole you know, world, a whole kind of scene was carved into the heel of the shoe. And I found that really interesting. And I'd written myself this note about her and that she was a Chinese designer artist and I thought oh maybe I'll just sort of see what she's about and I put in her name into Google and the Rihanna thing had just happened and there was a line in the story that I read where Gualpe said I didn't know who Rihanna was and that was the moment of intrigue for me because I thought how can somebody who's achieved you know this level of success within fashion not know who one of the most iconic people in the world is at the moment and that really intrigued me because I suppose I feel that there's a common denominator amongst all my films and that's isolation and I'm really interested in isolation and how people work within isolation and, and looking at it as a positive kind of a thing because I do believe that if you aren't influenced by too much or so much then maybe there's more of a purity about the work that you do. And so, yeah, I literally phoned her office and then hopped on a plane the next day. I thought maybe the common denominator was, um, Petra, that you don't like, um, you, you like to make films in foreign languages that you don't speak. Yes, yes there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. Um, it, I love that whole sort of full immersion of it all and the scariness of thinking I have no idea what they're saying and I don't know where we're going and I don't entirely understand what's going on, but I kind of love that. So there is, you're right, there is that. And it, it must be, as you say, it must change the process a bit because if you're filming, I'm presuming you've got a translator who's asking her a question, she's responding. No. But it's not no, until you've I translated that. You know yeah. what's been no, said? No, I don't or? have translators. I don't have anybody else with me. It's just my cinematographer and I. We don't have sound. We don't have fixes. You know, in Afghanistan and Libya, I didn't have security. It's just two people. And so I don't often know what's going on. And I am just following what, you know, what is happening. Um, and, yeah, and, and because I'm self-funding, it sometimes takes months before I have enough money to have 
the footage translated. So, you know, it takes quite a time for me to actually get to find out what's actually on that footage. But it is really interesting. You know, what I love is that you do, I do get a sense of what's happening in the scene, I think. I do get a feeling for a room or a space. And, you know, I think I can, can kind of feel and communicate in sort of different ways beyond language or culture or religion or sometimes gender in my films. And I kind of love that. I love that um, that there's another kind of a connection that's happening, you know, beyond language. So if I really needed to communicate with Guapay, then we would WeChat each other, which is this app um, which translates as you type. And so if I needed to, then I would use that. Petra, I've said this to you before, I just can't believe two people shot this film. It looks like <laughs> there were so many more people involved. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. so rich and beautiful and, and I, I find that amazing. I mean, obviously, I know that you've worked for a long time with your collaborator and cinematographer, Jacob Bryant. You must just have this sort of unspoken language between the two of you, do you? Yeah, there is that. But now I'm working with two people I've never worked with before. So I think that you know, you bring people along on a journey. And for me, the most important thing as a director is to provide a situation where the people I choose to work with do their best work. And so that's what I'm always conscious of. And at the moment, it's really exciting that I am working with different people. It's the nature of the two films that I'm making and that I'm currently making. And and it's, and it's just like, I'm, you know, I'm telling them what I look, what the look I'm going for, what kind of lenses, what kind of feel. But I just sort of believe that if you just encourage people, then they just, you know, they, they step up and they, and they get caught along, I suppose, maybe with, this, with whatever journey I've decided to go on. And people get enthusiastic because I'm so passionate about storytelling. Maybe I get them addicted a bit as well. But, um, but there's something really special about the intimacy of just two people. You know, and I think that that gives my films a unique quality, that there is this intimacy, there is this intense relationship between me and the subject of the film. And it isn't a friendship, and it's not a working relationship. It's sort of a therapist, you know, at times, but it is, it's a re remarkable kind of trust that they give me. And I think they give it to me because there is just two people. The film had its world debut at the Tribeca Film Festival last year, was that right? Yeah, yeah, it was in competition and opening weekend, which was really wonderful to sort of get that acknowledgement. Because, um, you know, it's tough when you have a subtitled film to break into certain markets, and North America is tough with subtitled films. So that was really such a wonderful um, acknowledgement for, for Guol Pei and for me and for the whole team that made the film. And obviously we're thrilled that we've been playing, we're, we're screening the film as well, but where, where, have, where else has this film taken you in the last year? Oh, well, I was in Shanghai last week, um, but it's, <laughs> it's been, you know, it's been all over the place, actually. And um, it's, yeah, it's screened, you name it, it's been there. It's, it's had an amazing uh, pick-up, actually, and, and it's soon to be on BBC on a very important strand called Storyville, um, and, you know, it just continues to do well and to sell. And it was interesting taking it back to the Chinese market and seeing the response. I mean, my thing is that once I finish a film, I never watch it again. So I never sit in with an audience, but I always wait afterwards to see their faces coming out. And um, so that was really lovely in Shanghai last week to sort of see people come out and hear what they reacted to. Because, of course, every culture has a different reaction to things and finds different things funny or not. And, um, you know, and because the film finishes with this wonderful moment that I won't, <laughs> I won't sort of, uh, you know, expose because hopefully people will see it on Rialto. But, um, but it is a really warm, beautiful moment that makes you cry and makes you laugh. And, and that seems to sort of transcend cultures. And even last week in Shanghai, people came out kind of laughing and, you know, and sort of wiping their eyes at the same time. 
That's really interesting that you don't watch a film once you've completed it. I was curious to know, because we're talking about this film, you know, almost a year after it had its world premiere, then of course there's the years, bef- you know, before that of actually getting it made. And I was curious as to whether when a film is made and you put it out there, you go, right, it's done, it's gone now, it's, it's left me, it's out there, it, it belongs yeah. to everybody else now, or whether you think about it or, you know. I do, I mean, I think about it because for me it's, you know, it's like a person, and mm, mm. and I do think about it, and I do care for it, and I and I am, you know, I'm I'm across where it's going, and I support it, but um, but I have only once watched one of my films with an audience, and I thought never again, and that was 12 years ago, and I just got so anxious about why people weren't laughing at the right time, why somebody got up and went to the bathroom, you know, I just found the whole thing just did my head in and I mean it's such an exposing thing it's like ripping out your heart and putting it you know offering it up to people I feel when I show my songs and so I thought god I don't need to torture myself any further really I'm never going to do this again so I never have <laughs> um, hey, pe- and, you just sorry, sorry keep going and, and I never watch them again you know even even privately I would never I finish the cut that's it it's done it's done so yeah, move on, kind of thing. Yeah, because I can like see so much fault in it as well. I want to re-edit it and recut it, and you know, and that's just ridiculous. It's, I have to. Yeah, have to it's got going. To, it's got to end. It's got to end. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Um, of course, last year you were invited to join the Academy and the 2019 yeah. with the first Oscars that you were involved with. How did that go? What was it like? What did you have to do? I'm just crossing. Okay. Uh, sorry, say that again. Sorry, I was just saying goodbye to something. That, that's all right. So uh, last year you were invited to become a member of the Academy and and vote at the Oscars. This year was the first time you had that opportunity to do that. How did it go? What did you have to do? What What was it all sort of like? Yeah, it's fantastic, actually. I mean, to be sort of, you know, be part of an international community of filmmakers beyond the voting, just just to be connected. And when I travel, there are events to connect, you know, into. But I was also lucky that my film, Yellow is Forbidden, was selected for both Best Foreign Language and Best Documentary. So I also went to LA and had screenings and events for my own film. So I was going to screenings of other people's films and also my own. And um, it was amazing, actually. And it's that thing of, you know, I mean, filmmaking is really, really tough. It sounds like such a cliche, but it is so friggin' tough. And especially documentary and independent documentary, the films that I make, it's very, very difficult to do, to finance, to sort of carry. It's very, can be very lonely. And so going to those screenings, it was like I was being wrapped up in hugs by other people who have been on the same journey as me and know how tough it is. And, and it's just this incredibly uplifting fellowship. And then to see the work of other filmmakers and to hear the stories that matter to them and, you know, what matters, how they treat that story. Because I think documentary at the moment is the most exciting art medium, I think. It encompasses so many different ways of treating a story. Animation, cinema verite, reenactment, sound design, music, installation, you know, I mean, three, you know, 3D, you name it, VR, you know, it's, it's all happening in documentary. And I think this is about people searching for truth and searching for real stories today and, and ways to understand this crazy world that we're currently experiencing. Mm. And so, you know, being in the academy is just like, for me, it's just feeling, you know, washed with all this inspiration and all this fellowship and these other wonderful people that are inspiring me. And hopefully, you know, I might inspire them a little bit as well. And I must congratulate you on another achievement. You've just um, become an Arts Laureate of New Zealand. Congratulations. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah, that was really unexpected. It was very funny because I got the email. Sort of, you know, like, congratulations, you uh, have have been selected. You are going to win this, and it involves money. Please send your bank details. And I said to my sister, Sharon, my God, what is this thing? And she's like, it's a scam. It's a scam. Don't send in your bank details. (laughs) Because whoever gets, you 
know, an email to say you've won some money and it's for real. And, and to win an award that you aren't aware of or haven't applied for. I mean, the whole thing was just hilarious. But then when, you know, when I then met with the people, I was like, oh, this is, this is for real. This is really happening. And, you know, it's that whole thing of, yes, it's wonderful to win awards, but to be acknowledged by your peers is, is really the thing. You know, I mean, to get that kind of acknowledgement from, from people who do what I do and make films and everything, that's just incredible, really. It's really special. So, Petra, I have to ask, what's next on the cards? What can we expect from you? <laughs> so I began a new film over a year ago, and it's a very multi-year long project. And then I began another film the day after the Christchurch attacks, and both of them are ongoing, and um, and as you know, I don't really talk much specifically about what my films are, and that's just kind of because, for me, it has to be this development of story that I um, that I have a real connection with and that reflects what I'm feeling and what I think is going on. The minute that I start to talk publicly about what it is, then it's kind of... For me, it sort of starts to feel um, I'm re- I might be reacting to somebody else's response, you know? And so yeah. I keep things pretty quiet for a while. And um, But both films are really interesting. They're developing in ways that I didn't imagine. And um, and hopefully they'll be good. I think they will. I think they will. I think there's real beauty in both of them. Oh, look, fabulous. We can't wait. And uh, we're absolutely thrilled that we're screening Yellow is Forbidden. It's screening on Rialto Channel on Wednesday, August 28th. Thanks so much, Petra. Thank you. And thanks to Rialto Channel. I mean, I've got to say, you know, being also screening at their 20th anniversary is really special because over the years that, that channel has supported so much of New Zealand filmmaking. And on that channel you can see, you know, it's not just one great film once in a while, as with many channels, it's consistent and you know, and I think we're really lucky here to have such an outlet for, for great films.